Welcome everyone to tutorial 12, which is today about autoregressive image modeling. So autoregressive uh, modeling or generative modeling, this sense um, more specific here on images, something you have seen maybe already in assignment 2 in the sense that you have generated new characters as language as an autoregressive model. Here we just take this concept and generalize it to images. If you generate text, the easy thing with autoregressive models is that the text is already a sequence. Right, so you know that one word comes after the other or one character comes after the other. In an image it's a bit more complicated because we have two dimensions. Right? We have the height and the width. So which pixel comes actually first in the image and which pixel comes last in the image. That's something we would have to decide for an autoregressive model. And what you usually do, what we will also follow here, is the simplest order of starting on the upper left and going down like what we have here. So on the upper left we say this is our first pixel, then we go over the whole row until the right upper pixel is xn, so this is then basically our uh, pixel of the last uh, part of the row, and then we just start here again. So that you see that we order the, uh, the image by starting the upper left and, and finishing bottom right. Thereby, what does it mean if we do now autoregressive modeling? Well, so we say we have a probability distribution which actually factorizes down here into these conditionals. So the probability of a whole image is the probability of pixel 1 times the probability of pixel 2 given pixel 1, then the times the probability of pixel d given x2 and x1, and so on. So there you see that every pixel in the image will be then predicted by a probability distribution given all pixels before. How we can train this model, we will see then in our tutorial here. Um, in general, so autoregressive models are again another type of generative modeling compared to VAE slow scans we have seen so far. Uh, the benefit here of these autoregressive models is that they are usually quite strong because they always model the exact likelihood while they are very slow in sampling. So, because as you can see, if I have an image of 64 times 64, I need to sample 64 times 64 through my model, and that is actually quite long. Um, in this tutorial, we will implement one very popular autoregressive model for images, namely Pixel CNN, architecture which you have probably shortly seen in uh, lecture 11. So this is tutorial still about uh, lecture 11, and we will then uh, detail a bit to see actually how does it work, how can we still use convolutions on autoregressive models. Beginning here we have again our import statements as well as pre-trained models. Similar to the normalizing flow we will train our models on MNIST, so just again on MNIST uh, digits. However, compared to uh, your VAE code, for example in assignment 3, we will again use 8-bit integers, so integer values between 0 and 255 instead of 0 or 1, as you have in the binary case. Again, just a few visualizations, which should show you how MNIST again looks like, just as a reminder. To start with our discussion of pixel CNN, let's first consider what we have to change in the convolutions. So as you know, convolutions are usually, for example, if they have the good, which I apply over my whole image as an image filter. However, this filter usually looks at all the pixels surrounding another pixel, so meaning that I, for if I go up to this image of our example, if I look at xi, I would use now a simple filter which would look at this directly grid. However, that's something we don't want to do in an autoregressive model because you see xi should only look at the pixels uh, in front of it, so on the left and to the top. While these pixels here are in the future, so meaning that we actually don't predict them, and uh, so predict them in next stages, so that if we apply convolutions, we only want to consider pixels which we have already seen, which we condition on to predict xi, so these blue ones, and ignore all the white ones because we are not conditioning on them. How can we do that? Well, the easiest solution is to just mask convolution. So if we have down here, for example, a 5x5 
kernel, we could just set all the values to zero, which are not the blue pixels we had up front in our image, and therefore we only look at pixels uh, above a pixel and on the left, which makes it, uh, for example, then easier to actually predict a pixel value without looking at anything else. This mass can then be, for example, applied if you have a 5 by 5 convolution, you just multiply this mask always on the weights before applying your convolution. That's a very simple one. Uh, that's actually also an idea we will use throughout here so that we use mask convolution. So we always have convolutions, but we will mask them throughout. So down here, I just implemented a very simple uh, template for mask convolution where you have a mask and you always multiply your weight with a mask before applying the convolutions, making sure that there are no gradients, for example, also flowing through it for the pixels we have set to zero. In pixel scene n, if you would, so the original pixel scene n actually always applied these mass convolutions. However, you will come uh, to a problem if you do that, namely a blind spot, blind spot here, in the sense that a pixel, our xn, which we had before, cannot actually attend or look at pixels on its right upper part, because if you apply this mass convolutions multiple times, you see that this is how the receptor field grows. We cannot look to the right, um, because otherwise we would actually break our constraint uh, with the filter we have here, with a mask filter. The idea which came with an update of pixel CNN, or what they also called gated, gated pixel CNN we will see afterwards, is that you split actually this kernel into a vertical stack and a horizontal stack. So what does that mean? The, the mass convolutions we had on top here, we will actually split into two parts. The vertical stack will have this kernel up here, so all the ones on the upper part, while the horizontal stack will use these parts, so always looking to the left, while the vertical stack always looks on top. If we do that, and then have a vertical stack applying on vertical stack, basically, if we have their convolutions applying on itself and their convolutions applying on itself, you will see that the receptor field grows exactly as we want, so that we don't have a blind spot here. We will visualize it below as well. So let's first implement the idea. We have a vertical stack convolution, a horizontal stack convolution, vertical stack convolution. So here I just use again mass convolutions for both of the uh, both stacks, just to make it simpler here. So I take basically our theory by theory kernel and just mask everything besides this row. Well, then in the horizontal one, I take a one by n so that I only have uh, over with and then mask everything to the right. First part we can do is then to visualize with the receptor field of these uh, layers so you can actually get familiar what we're doing here. So I just wrote a simple function here which takes in an image and a function uh, and builds me a computation graph and on that one we visualize the receptor field meaning how much or which input pixel actually influence the output pixel here or is the center. So if I apply a horizontal convolution, you see so the uh, center pixel is always red uh, marked here. And if I apply a three by three, here actually a three by one, horizontal kernel, I only look to the left. Note that we say here mask center equals two. So we will have two versions of these filters, one that masks the center pixel in our kernel and one which doesn't. This is because we will use teacher forcing. So during training we will use the actual input image and our first convolution should not look at the center pixels. So you should not predict a pixel based on its actual value because that would be, well, uh, obvious. So we always mask this in the first convolution. We effectively um, shift the image then by one and then we can run all our convolutions with the center pixel active. So this is also the case if you have here vertical stack convolution, we uh, yeah, we mask the center and we just look on top. So these two you now see what is actually the receptor field for a pixel here if I apply one convolution. Um, what you actually do then in a pixel CNN, in a gated pixel CNN specifically, is that you will add both a vertical stack and a horizontal stack so that you achieve this kind of receptor field. So this L form, again, which we got from our 
uh, stack before. However, what happens now if you apply more uh, layers or more filters, then you see that if we have this vertical stack and this horizontal stack, the receptor field grows one by one, with both the vertical stack growing and the horizontal stack growing. One important part is here that when we sum them, we actually just add the vertical stack to the horizontal stack, but not the other way around. Why are we doing that? Because otherwise we would actually look at invalid pixels. So I, otherwise we would actually look into the future, which we do not want. And this is why we can only add the vertical one here to the horizontal one. Uh, it's probably easier to understand if you really try it yourself. So what actually happens if you would do it the other way. Um, in the end, we will see that our receptor field, if we just look at the vertical stack, is really everything above the pixel, while, while if we take both, so this red pixel actually then looks at every other pixel in the image, which is exactly what we have wanted. And we can use convolutions and teacher forcing to enable a fast training here. In the end, we can just delete here our, uh, our computation graph just to be a bit more efficient.